I've already described for you the usage of the mean in statistics. Unfortunately, however, there are times when a simple mean will not suffice. There are times when we have additional information that must be considered as we are calculating a mean. However, we have options for means. And so, with apologies to Thomas More, no matter what is going on with your data, we have a mean for all seasons. The first mean that we're going to discuss is the trimmed mean. You would choose a trimmed mean when you have outliers in your data set. I've described that the mean is susceptible to outliers. If you have outliers in your data set, they create additional leverage that could affect the mean, moving it toward the outlier, making it less representative of the rest of the scores in your distribution. And so what we might choose to do is to trim off a portion of that distribution from the upper and lower ends, which would effectively remove the outliers, giving us the average of the range within that distribution. An example of this that I used in the real world was asking people to report the number of hours that they had volunteered for a nonprofit organization. They were asked to say how many hours in the last month they volunteered. Most people said that they volunteered for three to six hours in the previous month. However, I had a few individuals, uh, one in particular, who reported over 40 hours of volunteer work. The problem was, I didn't know whether that was legitimate or not. It is possible that one person volunteered 40 hours in the last month. It wasn't typical, but it was possible. What I did, therefore, was to report not only the mathematical mean, add up all the scores, divide by n, but also the trimmed mean. I trimmed off the upper and lower 5% of the distribution and reported that mean as well. This gave us a much clearer and honest picture of the typical number of hours being volunteered within this group. A second time when we want to use something different than a mean would be if I was asking you how much you spend on average for gasoline. Now we know that gasoline prices fluctuate. Gas prices go up and then they go up and then up again. Therefore, if I wanted to know how much you have spent on gasoline over the last two months, I need to know not only how many gallons you purchased, but also how much each gallon cost. And so for that, I'm going to use a weighted mean. A weighted mean includes additional influences on the overall cost as part of the calculus. If we're buying grain at a certain cost per pound, it could be useful to know not only how much did you buy, but how much it cost at the time. Or if we're looking at your grades, you have a GPA to be calculated as an average grade. However, getting a 4.0 in a class that's only one hour will influence your overall GPA less than getting uh, an F in a four hour course. Therefore, we are, we are going to weight the number of hours by the actual grade that you received in the class. That's called a weighted mean. A weighted mean simply means that we're going to be using multiplication. We're going to multiply the number of gallons of gasoline purchased by the cost of the purchase, and we're going to average that amount to give us a more honest appraisal of how much money was actually spent. A third circumstance in which using a simple mathematical mean will not suffice is when we're looking at investments. Now we know that there's a typical upswing in the return on investment. However, there are these little cycles that occur along the way. If you invest $100 at the top of one of those cycles, you're gonna ride it down before it increases. However, if you had invested that same $100 at the bottom of the cycle, you would have ridden that all the way up. 
And so your average return could be a function of the time at which you invest it. Therefore, if we have a circumstance like that, we will use a geometric mean. It calculates the average rate of change over successive time periods. And it is most commonly used with financial data for growth rates, such as population growth, crop yields, hospital admissions, or pollution level. An example of when I've used a geometric mean in the real world was helping my wife figure out how many admissions and discharges occurred on the unit in which she works at a hospital. The number of admissions is a function of the number of discharges because there's a limited number of beds. Let's say there are 30 beds available. If at the end of the weekend, 15 patients are discharged, there are now 15 open beds, which means there can be more admissions. However, if at the end of the weekend, 28 of those beds are already filled, then we only have room for two admissions. We have to consider both the number of discharges and admissions to calculate that rate of change. And for that, we used a geometric mean. The geometric mean relies on calculating a growth factor, which is one plus 0 0.01 times the percentage return. And all you need to know about the interpretation of a growth factor is that values greater than one indicate growth. A value of one indicates no change and values less than one indicate loss. The growth factor can never be negative. And when I teach you about growth factors and geometric means using Excel, you will see that the geo mean function will only work with positive values. If you try to run the geo mean function with negative values, you will get an error. But don't worry, I'll show you how we would calculate the geometric mean using Excel. As I said, we have options. No matter what's going on with our data, there is a mean for all seasons.